What are we all doing here? <clears throat> we are not supposed to be here. This is going to be the slowest you have ever heard me talk in your lives. <laughs> this is just too big. <clears throat> and it's so big that I haven't really even been able to figure out how I'm going to do this or what I'm even going to say. I'm struggling. I am at a loss. The person that sat 10 feet away from me for the past 13 years is suddenly gone. <clears throat> it's really too much. So I think the only way that I can talk about life with Heather is if I focus on little things. And maybe when I'm done, we can string together a handful of these little things and the little moments that I shared with Heather. And that way I can give you some idea. Of the essence of the woman and how much she meant to me. and how very much I'm going to miss having her in my life. <laughs> Heather and I were fixed up by David Geffen's office, Natch. <laughs> it was an arranged marriage. That's the way we used to uh, do it down in the gay shtetl in the day. Uh, we met on the Radford lot. I was, uh, I was working on the crown jewel of my writing career, uh, Good Morning Miami. Uh, a show that included a, a nun that did the weather. Um, Heather and I were into each other from the moment we laid eyes on one another which is hard to believe because the first time I met her, she was wearing a wrinkled red Talbot suit. <laughs> and, and size 15 slingback pumps that, that were so chewed up, they looked like she had just hitchhiked across the country in them. Um, years later, she would admit to me that she had dressed herself in her car for the interview <laughs> and was mostly worried about sweating through her smart blazer. <laughs> I, uh, I don't really remember what she told me about herself that afternoon, but clearly I was impressed. Uh, I do remember the only question I asked her at the interview because I knew it would tell me everything I wanted to know. I asked her, do you love your mother? And she said that indeed she did. And you know that, Nancy. I hired her on the spot, and I told her the place was hers to run. I only had one rule. Don't fuck Dave Cohan. <laughs> she found sticking to that rule a lot easier than Dave would care to admit. And for the record, she was hired to work for me and Cohan. On paper, we shared her. And clearly, 
they had a special bond. He was her boss for many years, but to me, Heather was all mine. The first project I gave Heather was to organize a fundraiser at my house for Bill Clinton. She took on the assignment with a surprising confidence and the event turned out amazing. She did it like an old pro. She sat Carrie Lizer next to Bill Clinton. <laughs> she knew what she was doing. She sat Kevin Spacey next to a cute cater waiter. <laughs> I'll admit it if he won't. Uh, she, she got how to do things. She even got Peter Roth to come to the event. And I think I was more nervous about Peter and Andrea Roth being at my house that night than I was about Bubba being there. <laughs> the next day I told her that she had done such an incredible job that I wanted to buy furniture uh, for her for the new apartment that she had just gotten. Uh, she was very uncomfortable with the idea, but ultimately she gave in um, as a result of my relentless, guilt-driven, inappropriate Jewish, here, take this because I'm gonna be a nightmare to work with, giving thing. I said, pick out whatever you want and I'll call the store with my credit card and pay for whatever you choose. I told her to get stuff for her entire flat. Um, after she picked the stuff out, she uh, came to work and she said she thought that it was a bad idea and that if I wanted to, you know, uh, I could back out of it. When I called the store, frankly, I was shocked. Uh, I think I furnished the dump for 600 bucks. Uh, see, I thought I was going to uh, We were both happy. But what's important to note from this first little story about Heather and me is the fact that a precedent was now set. A precedent that would last. A precedent that would last our entire relationship. We took care of one another. And by we, of course, I mean Heather took care of me. I wish everyone in this room that I love, and that's almost all of you, <laughs> I wish in your lifetime you could be blessed with the gatekeeper, the confident, the confidant, the drug mule. Uh, <laughs> what does it matter? <laughs> what is HR going to do now? <laughs> she picked up my Ativan <laughs> and some Vicodin. And once, she got me Oxycontin for the Golden Globes. Uh, you sit next to Deborah Messing for eight years in a row. Um, uh, not a single globe, we never won an award. Uh, to her core, Heather was a full-time, fully committed support system. This brings me to the essential truth of my relationship with her. With Heather in my life, I knew I was always going to be safe. Somehow, this young woman from Clifton Park, New York, showed up at my office 13 years ago and gave me something that no shrink or silly boyfriend or fancy showbiz friend could do for me. She taught me. <laughs> she taught me how to trust. Absolutely and unequivocally. And she never violated that trust. When Heather was in the room with me, I was at peace. Even when I wasn't feeling peaceful, and that was a lot. I knew Heather was gonna be on the other side of a bad phone call or a tough day of writing, and my connection to her would soothe me. Besides my husband, she is literally the only person in the world that I can fall asleep in front of. 
It's a tender notion, but it goes in only one direction. I had my rule, and Heather had hers. She would not touch me when I was asleep. <laughs> I grossed her out. Maybe it was my mouth breathing or my, my nap terrors where I would wake up in my chair at work because I thought I was being ch choked to death by Chuck Lorre. <laughs> As the years passed, we became closer and closer. We were able to say more with less words. In fact, our relationship was so solid, so in sync, so contained that it took us a little while to realize that we were both lacking the same thing, husbands. That's when she fell in love with the amazing Jason Irvin. And that's when I found Eric. But Heather and I were still gonna take care of one another. I insisted that she and Jason get married in the backyard of my humble Beverly Hills estate. <laughs> For the record, she offered in return to allow Eric and I to legally wed in her Toluca Lake two-bedroom, two-bath. <laughs> in the end, we took a pass on that offer, uh, basically because I felt the same way about getting married in her apartment as she felt about waking me up. Uh, I never will forget seeing Heather walk down the stairs in our house on the day of her wedding. She had never looked so beautiful to me. And because of what our relationship had become, we just stared at each other. We said nothing. Finally, she said, what do you think? I put my arms around her because I loved her so much. And I whispered into her ear, the tailor has totally fucked up your dress. <laughs> you look like the three-titted freak from Total Recall. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm the only one who will notice. And because Heather loved me as much as I loved her, she would later tell me that I ruined her wedding because <laughs> I insisted that they turn off the music too early. I wanted to go to bed. Um, I don't love the fact that she thinks I ruined her wedding, but I do love that she was honest enough and felt close enough to me to tell me that I did. I don't love that I bought her a BMW as a way of atoning for ruining her wedding. <laughs> but I do love the fact that she accepted it. <clears throat> there, there is no sense of what happened on December 22nd. And there are no lessons in it. There are just feelings of sadness and of loss. <clears throat> and if there is any spin that I can put on it, it's this. I have these feelings because I loved her so much. We all did. We loved someone deeply because we allowed ourselves to have open hearts. Everyone in this room is hopefully feeling something because they are in touch with the only thing that will matter in our lifetime. It's who and how much we love. If Heather's death has given me anything, it has put me in touch with my capacity to love. He's also done a good job with that too. I'm talking about Eric, not Dave. <laughs> Dave's done good too. And I hope that's done that for all of us. And for me, that's enough. I'll search no further because as horrible and, and difficult and unimaginable as all of this is, I'm going to try very hard to keep the love that Heather created in me alive and to allow it. and to allow that love to see me through the next days and weeks that lay ahead. 
Heather Hicks made me a better man while she was alive. And somehow, she has figured out a way to do it after she's gone. Thank you, Heather. I love you. Oh, here we go. Me, 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 me. Happy birthday to you. Cha, cha, cha. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Missy. Cha, cha, cha. Happy birthday. Can't do it. Can't do it. Now warm it up, Nick. Give it a drink for cold water so the vocal cords are tight. Once there was a way to get back home. Once there was a way. To get back home Sleep pretty darling Do not cry And I will sing a lullaby Golden slumbers fill your eyes Smile Once there was a way to get back homeward. Once there was a way to get back home. Sleep, pretty darling, don't you cry. I'll 